Testing, testing, one, two, three, if you can hear me, someone just type, yes, I can hear you. All right, fantastic. I love it when technology works well for us. Good afternoon. And on behalf of Sisters Network Incorporated, our National Board of Directors, affiliate chapters, staff, and volunteers, welcome to Webinar Wednesday, hosted by Sisters Network and sponsored by Mon Cosmetics and in partnership with the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas. I am Kelly P. Hodges, the National Program Director for Sisters Network and facilitator for today's webinar. Sisters Network is a leading voice and the only national African-American breast cancer survivorship organization. Founded in 1994 by Karen E. Jackson, Sisters Network is governed by an elected board of directors and assisted by an appointed medical advisory board. The organization's purpose is to save lives and provide a broader scope of knowledge that addresses the breast cancer survivorship crisis affecting African-American women around the country. Sisters Network is very excited about Webinar Wednesday. Thank you to those who have participated in previous webinars, but if you missed the previous webinars, you can actually view those uh, from the homepage of the Sisters Network website or visit our YouTube channel at Sisters Network INC. And a quick note before I introduce today's presenter, the Q&A session will take place at the end of the presentation. Please note your questions and hold them until the end. Every effort will be made to address all questions. Additional questions can be emailed to social media at sistersnetworkinc.org. Sisters Network aims to provide useful and informative information to survivors, caregivers, health professionals, or those who just want to know more about health care, breast cancer, and survivorship. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tamara Como. Dr. Como's specialties include wellness, weight and vitamin intake counseling, as well as bioidentical hormone replacement, in-office sterilization, in-office endometrial ablation via her option, in-office ultrasounds, and outpatient incontinence surgery. Dr. Coma received her medical degree from Morehouse, Morehouse School of Medicine. She completed her residence in obstetrics and gynecology at Wayne State University School of Medicine, and she is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Como also received a doctorate of naturopathic medicine and a master's in holistic medicine. She has written books on diet and nutrition to aid patients in their quest for good health. Dr. Como is a member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. She recently completed a fellowship in integrative cancer therapy. Dr. Como believes there are great advancements being made towards understanding the human body's delicate balance and the way our health, diet, and nutrition are all interconnected. The California native enjoys reading books, traveling, and exercising. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Como. Dr. Como? Thank you, Kelly. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, as Kelly was telling you, I see patients in a practice on the northwest side of Houston. I started off uh, practicing obstetrics and gynecology, but as I my education continued, I started to branch out more into health and wellness. And today we are going to talk about skin and how that has an impact on our health and wellness and how our health and wellness is reflected in our skin. And you know, as we all know, wrinkles are a part of getting older and our skin ages as we age. People can usually tell the difference between a 10-year-old and a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old and so on and so forth. But we're going to talk about how to control our internal environment and um, make it so that people don't always guess our age correctly. I think we're all on that uh, page right now. Um, 
taking care of your body inside and out, you can change the rate of aging. Everyone doesn't have to age at 55 miles an hour. If you want to age at 10 miles an hour, you have to put some sort of effort into that. You know, the skin reflects beauty as well as health, and it does reflect your internal and external well-being. If you were to all of a sudden have everything in balance, like your hormones and your vitamins and perfect nutrition, and I went and took your thyroid organ out or your ovaries out, your skin would start to change, even if you kept a lot of different things uh, perfect. Even if you were taking the best hair, skin, and nails vitamin, and I removed your ovaries and you were 30 years old, your skin would start to change differently. So everything plays a part in what your skin looks like. Or if you had high cholesterol, or kidney disease, or high blood pressure, all of those different things change the demands on your body. And responding to those demands properly can help your skin age properly. So, you know, I'm a proponent of um, believing that your body will heal itself if you give it the right tools. And the right tools aren't exactly the same for every human being on the planet. You know, your gender plays a role, your genetics play a role, what uh, you're allergic to plays a role. So a lot of different things that are going on in your body play a role and determine what the right tools are. So you have about 20 square feet of skin. It's one of the largest organs in your body. And yes, the skin is an organ. Your organs aren't just your pancreas and your heart and your liver. Your skin is an organ. It absorbs things. It eliminates things. So it shows us a lot, and it has a job to do. Um, it's not isolated from the other organs in the body. And treating any skin condition externally, if you don't pay attention to what's going on inside, may uh, show itself. Most topical medications and over-the-counter things do a little more than temporarily cover up a problem if you do have a problem with your skin because the skin keeps things out. When we sit in the tub, we don't just absorb 10 gallons of water. Our skin has a capacity to absorb some things, but it keeps a lot of things out. So we have to um, pay attention to that. A lot of what we do to our skin has got to come from the inside and be reflected outward because everything that comes on top of our skin doesn't get in. It protects us. Also to mention, hair and nails are an extension of your skin and are also indicative of internal health. So a person who has dry, brittle nails or dry, brittle hair, there's usually something more going on than just what they're putting on their hair and what they're putting on their nails. So our skin is also a dynamic organ. We have skin now, but it is not the same skin that was on our body five years ago. And it's not the same skin that's going to be on our body five years from now. For instance, did you know that by the age of 70, we have shed approximately 40 pounds of skin cells? I'm sure you've all seen those commercials where you know they say replace your mattress every 10 years because you've got all these dead skin cells and things in your mattress. That is true. We are constantly, you know, as we're laying in our sheets, we're exfoliating. Our skin is always changing. We make new skin about every seven years. Um, and the rate at which we our skin changes is determined by how much inflammation we have in our body, how we eat, and things like that. So as I mentioned, a glowing healthy skin reflects a healthy body. So what are some of the factors that cause our skin to age? Well, one of them, of course, is genetics. Some of our mothers don't have wrinkles and that helps us in the long run. Some people have families where they do are sensitive to wrinkles. Or how much melanin is in your skin determines what gets through, your vitamin D levels, things like that. But in genetics, we really cannot control. But inflammation is one of our major culprits in skin aging. 
Inflammation has a lot to do with our environment. Sun, pollution, weather conditions. Do you live in Los Angeles? Is there smog outside? Do you live around fresh air? Do you smoke? Alcohol that you drink? Because all of those different things are a job for your skin to do. If you smoke, your body's going to try to eliminate more toxins. If you drink alcohol, your skin now has a job. Instead of being in healing mode, it now has to be in excretion mode. And how often your skin has to go between healing mode and excretion mode does have a role to play in how it ages. Just it's wear and tear on your skin. So even before you take a skin vitamin or use a skin product, just the basic wear and tear of what you do and how your life is has a lot to do with your skin. So what is genetic aging? Um, all of us can get lines and wrinkles and lose firmness. But genetic aging really is determining how your collagen behaves. Our skin is made up of something called collagen and elastin. So collagen is the fibers in your skin and elastin is how they sit together and smooth themselves out. And as you age, the type of collagen and the rate at which you make collagen changes. Your skin becomes thinner. It loses firmness. The elasticity changes. So even people who don't wrinkle will notice that their skin is thinner and has a different texture. You can pinch your skin and get more elasticity going in it. And people can tell your age. Like a lot of people who don't wrinkle, I can look at their neck and see if there's lines in their neck or even see like if they're making moles, different things happen to your skin as you age that wouldn't have happened when you were, say, 20. So, another thing about coll um, collagen production, it begins to naturally taper off around the age of 35. And this is around the age at which our hormones begin to change. You don't necessarily feel at the age of 35 that your hormones are changing, but frequently this is when we begin to have some fluctuations. Um, and it's worsened by the impact of your, your environment at the age of 35. By the time you're 35, you might have children. Therefore, you get less sleep. Therefore, you have more stress. So all of those things meshing together will have an impact on your age, uh, skin health at the age of 35. Um, so. The earlier we start to use proper skin products and oils and pay attention to what we're putting on our skin and in our bodies, the better. But definitely I would tell people around the age of 35, not when you get the wrinkles and try to reverse them, but prior to getting the wrinkles and helping your skin along that journey is the time to do it. Also another note about when you're 35, if you talk to most of your friends who are 30 or 35, they're not on a lot of prescription medications, they don't have thyroid disease yet, they don't have hypertension yet, they don't have diabetes yet, so your skin can age kind of slower, you don't have all of these different demands, but by the time your friends are 40, go ask all of your friends between 40 and 45, some of them are going to be on a medication, right? So now you've got another thing that has happened. Um, and so your diet, your skin care regimen, the type of supplements you take, how much water you drink are all going to be a big factor in how your skin ages from that day forward. Because between 20 and 30, you don't see a big difference in skin. And between 30 and 40, you can kind of tell the difference between a 30-year-old and a 40-year-old, but it's going at a you know, a year by year rate. Right around between 40 and 50, you can really tell that that age span is a big difference. So paying attention to the small details is going to really help a lot. So 
I mentioned water a little bit already, but we'll talk a little bit more about the composition of the human body. We're mostly water. Um, we are lipids, which are oils. We are proteins, so we need to be mindful of our protein. And we're also minerals and other components, like our bones and things like that. Everything I tell you about helping your skin is also going to help your bones and your cartilage and your ligaments and your blood vessels are even made of collagen. So everything you do and put inside your body to help your collagen can also determine how your other diseases go. So the well-being of the human body depends on the balance of these different components. So, and this slide has a lot of detail, but we'll just briefly talk about healthy skin versus normal skin. And you can see how much thicker the healthy skin is than the aging skin. There's more fat in the subcutaneous layer. As that shrinks down, your skin will sort of fall down your face. The collagen fibers look different and they're linked differently. The elastin. There's something in your skin called hyaluronic acid, which is kind of like a, kind of a jelly substance that's in your skin and the more that you have the fuller and more beautiful your skin looks and the less of it you have it's kind of thinner and flatter. Hyaluronic acid is what people put in their cheekbones to make themselves look younger. It's called Restylane or uh, one of those products that gives your face that kind of fluff, that puffy cheekbones that young people have and not that hollowed out appearance that people get as they get older. So Skin aging is not just wrinkles, but it's also thinner skin, your skin sags, your eyes are lower, your chin starts to go lower just because your collagen isn't as linked and tight as it used to be. So the collagen theory of aging. As we age, the collagen ages too. Your 20-year-old collagen is not does not look the same as your 40-year-old collagen. Think about it. When you're 20, even if you don't eat right and even if you smoke, your body's very efficient. So the vitamins that you get out of food, you've got a storage of them. You're, you have extra. So on the days you don't get enough, your body uses that reserve. Then you have a couple of children. They've taken some of your iron. They've taken some of your calcium. They've taken some of your vitamin D. Plus, you're older. So a lot of the the days that you're not taking in enough vitamins, you're using all of that storage. Then by the time you're 35 years old or 40 years old, you're kind of out of storage. So on the days that you don't eat enough vitamins, you're just lacking. Your body still needs to make a skin cell. It still needs to make other things. So it's going to still try to make them. It's just going to make them with what it's got. It's like if you have a recipe at home and you're kind of missing something and you substitute something else because that's what you have, it turns out different. So the same thing as you're aging with your skin, if you don't have something at that time, it's going to turn out different. And that happening repetitively is going to make a difference. Like I said, you turn over skin every seven years. And the typical thing that happens is that it gets worse and worse every year. It doesn't get better and better every year. But if you try harder, you can make it so that the every seven year span isn't doesn't look like a seven seven years have elapsed. So, so we talked about collagen already. We'll move on to back to the concept of the fact that everything changes when you're around 35 and 40. Now, not only do you need vitamins or vitamin C or to make your collagen, but there's something about what tells the collagen to make itself. That would be your estrogen. We're women, we have estrogen. It stimulates fibroblasts to make collagen. So decreased levels of estrogen are associated with losing collagen and increased wrinkling. And hormones protect your skin from aging. Now, most of us will have uh, some hormonal activity until we're about 50. But those of you who might have um, had a hysterectomy, have had your ovaries removed and are not taking any sort of hormonal replacement therapy, even some plant-based herbs, 
or someone who might have had chemotherapy and which caused them to go through premature menopause. Think about how that's going to impact your skin health because now the estrogen you were not having to think about, now you have to think about. So that will change the rate at which you might age or visibly age. And also other ways because like I said, collagen isn't just about the skin on your face, it also makes up your blood vessels. If you don't make proper collagen and you make harder blood vessels, you now might have hypertension because it's not as flexible and elastic and pliable. So it all gets kind of related. Skin aging and hypertension kind of increase at the same rate as far as us aging. All right. And also, your hormones have a lot to do with how you capture vitamins, like vitamin D. So when you're younger and you don't have enough vitamin D, you might get away with it. Once you turn 35 and 40, you don't have as much estrogen. And then your lack of vitamin D, your lack of going into the sun, might have an impact. When you're 20, you have time to go hang out in the sun with your friends, when you're older, taking care of children, getting in and out of the car, you're more aware of sunscreen, you might not be getting your vitamin D from the sun like you think. And now you're older, your bones are asking you for more vitamin D and calcium. Your skin might actually not win that battle between who's going to get the vitamin D in your body. So around the age that women get osteoporosis, that's the age at which a lot of women are going to notice skin issues because now this vitamin D that we're taking is being shared by different organs. We never know who's going to win. You also have to think about people who already have eczema and psoriasis. They have an increased need for vitamins, especially vitamin D. Without enough, they might notice more flare-ups. So they already have an inflammatory skin issue. So that's another factor when you're thinking, how am I going to proceed in the future taking care of my skin and I already have a metabolic demand on my skin. So we just talked about vitamin D and the sun briefly, but if you look at this photo of women who spend a lot of time in the sun versus a woman who does not spend a lot of time in the sun or someone who is protecting her skin, you will see that how you protect yourself from the sun does have an impact because ultraviolet rays from the sun will contribute to skin aging. So, some of the, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Go back. Um, some of the things that we can do to slow down damage is use antioxidants. There's a lot of products that advertise that they have antioxidants. You can also take antioxidant supplements. Um, things that stop inflammation are things you want to pay attention to. Things that block ultraviolet rays. Uh, and things, wound healing, enhancing collagen synthesis. Those of you who have stretch marks or who have ever gone to the store to look for a stretch mark or scar cream, those are things that will help how collagen regenerates because you need to replace collagen faster if you're trying to heal a wound or a keloid or a stretch mark. And like I said before, the solution is not only topical, Skin is influenced by nutrition and hormones also. So let's go on to 92% of, of Americans do not get the required daily allotment of nutrients from the food they eat. So we're going to go into right now the types of food you should eat, but still because of the way soil is, because of how we cook certain things, we might not be getting all the vitamins that we think that we should get. So, also as we age, we gain weight, so we're more likely to try to start restricting our calories. This also might impact 
our skin health when we're trying not to eat certain things. A lot of people think, oh, avocados are fattening or nuts, they're fattening, let me eat less of them. But they do have uh, different uh, omega-3 fatty acids in them that are good for skin. So, and as we age, our nutritional needs change. And also, we want to make sure we replace our nutrients. Now, the vitamin theory of skin aging is a little difficult because everyone has a different need. Some people, for instance, drink a lot of milk. So they might not need to take a calcium and D supplement because they can eat dairy, they feel fine when they drink milk, they eat yogurt, and things like that. Many people are lactose intolerant. So when I, somebody tells me that milk bothers them, they can't even eat ice cream, those people I would tell to take calcium and vitamin D. So I can't just make a recommendation, everybody take one thing because it really depends on what people tell me that they already eat. We try to replace things that they are not eating. Someone says, hi, I hate fish. I would tell that person, take omega-3. It's good for your skin. Someone says, hi, I'm lactose intolerant. I would tell that person, okay, you would take calcium and vitamin D. So when it comes to hair, skin, and nail vitamins, it's very difficult to just make one recommendation because it depends on the disease or their diet or what they avoid that I would try to replace. So let's just have a general healthy skin diet, but I prefaced it by saying that you might have a particular need or disease or something that we need to address. But you would want to eat a variety of foods, lots of fruits and vegetables, limit consumption of red meat, just because red meats are inflammatory, especially those that are high in fat and processed. Even weight gain will stretch your skin, then if you subsequently lose weight, you've just lost a lot of that elastin. And also we talked earlier about liver and elimination. So if you drink alcoholic beverages and your skin is doing a lot of work trying to excrete that alcohol, uh, you would have some difficulty trying to heal your skin. Okay, let's talk about the toxin overload. We all hear about toxins. We watch Dr. Oz. We've been exposed to you know toxins in what we eat in the water and the food, but there's chemicals in our environment. Even some of the skin products and soaps that we use have parabens and phthalates. They have things in them that are providing us with more toxic overload. So the first thing you want to do instead of going to, I'm, I'm all about detoxifying and using a supplement to detoxify and eliminate, but the first thing you want to look at is Take everything you've ever tried to use on your skin, including your soaps, and read the ingredients and make sure they are things you can pronounce. So even the plastic bottles that you drink out of, you want to make sure they say BPA free. You don't want to go and drink 64 ounces of water a day because I told you to drink 64 ounces of water a day and then have it come in a bottle that has it's going to give you toxic overload. So you want to pay attention to just, sometimes it's not what you do, it's what you don't do. So you want to watch that. Um, so not only is your skin an organ of detoxification, but your liver is an organ of detoxification, your kidneys, your lungs, and things like that. So. If you have a liver disease, if you have a lung disease, if you have problems with menstruation, are you eliminating properly? Are your organs able to detoxify? Are you constipated? Do you only go to the bathroom once a week? How can you have good skin if you do not eliminate all the toxins in your body through your colon? Your skin is going to try to eliminate more toxins and then you're not going to have very good looking skin if it's doing your, the work of your bowel or your liver. So another thing I tell people about skin is like the first thing is make sure all of your organs are in line. Your kidney, your lungs, your liver, 
your colon. Make sure they are functioning properly before you go and try to put a skin cream on your body. Um, so, inflammation. Um, we're going to go past inflammation and just talk about healthy skin. We already talked about the vegetables and everything, but let me just talk briefly about petroleum jelly, just to illustrate my point about organs of elimination. So a lot of us probably, if you look at your uh, closet and see all of your skin products, you might see that petroleum jelly is in a lot of the products. And it leaves your skin very moist, so you think that it's moisturizing. But petroleum jelly basically forms a layer of shellac over your skin. So when your body's trying to eliminate, can it get through the petroleum jelly? Not really. It makes your skin feel comfortable. It blocks water and moisture. Nothing can get in. But also, things getting out is very important. So, we talked about water already. Um, go through dietary supplements. Natural health products are meant to complement your healthy eating and lifestyle, but they are not everything. I will say one thing about supplements and here's the thing let's say you have a very stressful life and I give you the best a vitamin pack with every supplement that could ever happen to your skin all in one pack and you take it every day and then you go to a very stressful job where you work 18 hours a day that supplement will not do a lot for you because all of that stress, people can see it. When, some, when you walk into someone's office and they're very angry and stressed, your first thought is never, oh wow, they have beautiful skin. Because the way people speak, the way people act, how stressed they look, how rushed they look, has a lot to do with their skin. And if you're stressed and rushed every day, that is very detrimental to your skin health. Everything else I have said today is not as important. You can hydrate properly, have perfect health, perfect weight, perfect organs, eat out of you know by the book. But if you are if you have a very 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 stressful job or stressful life or stressful children, and you have not found a way to balance that, your skin is going to show it, and you are not going to age slower. Um, the other issue we will discuss is sleep. So even if you do get home at a normal time and you have issues with sleep that have not been addressed, eight hours of sleep is better than any pill, any diet, any amount of water, staying out of the sun. You must sleep. A person who gets four hours of sleep just isn't going to regenerate skin very well. So now we are going to talk about the vitamins but still keeping in mind that sleep and stress are two very important things. Um, the important thing on this page that most of you probably don't know about is probiotics. Probiotics are very, very important for skin, and I will say why. We've all heard of acne. Acne is a usually caused by a certain type of bacteria. So we take antibiotics for that bacteria. Um, so that illustrates the concept that there is a balance between the types of bacteria on our skin. We are not antibacterial creatures. We walk outside, there's bacteria on our skin. There's oil. It's supposed to be there. We put makeup on our skin. There's, you know, there's the environment that the skin is in is very important. Probiotics are good bacteria. They're beneficial bacteria. They benefit our colon. Well, earlier, I briefly spoke about how colon health is important with your skin. So if you took a probiotic and it helped your colon be healthier, 
how would that change your skin? It would be better, right? If you took probiotics and your, skin, your bowels were regular, your skin would be better. Um, so that, that is a supplement that people should pay attention to. If you have normal colon health and you eat yogurt every once in a while, that's great. But if you don't ever eat yogurt and you don't have normal colon health, a probiotic is definitely something you should trial to see how that impacts your skin health. And the other thing on here is essential fatty acids, and we're going to get into a little bit of detail about that. Now, antioxidants are on this page, and I will tell you why antioxidants are something you want to think about. I already told you about eating fruits and vegetables, so this slide really is just more detail about why you want fruits and vegetables to pay attention. Now, when you go outside, there's sun. It causes damage in the form of free radicals. What is the antidote to a free radical? Antioxidants. It does the opposite of what the free radical. The free radical wants to damage you. The antioxidant wants to fix it. So I've already told you, eat fruits and vegetables. That's great. But in a lot of skin products and a lot of skin vitamins, there are things like vitamin C, vitamin E, soy, resveratrol, which comes from red wine. So those are things you want to pay attention to in your diet, in your supplements, and in your skin protocols that help you. So that is the important thing about antioxidants. And the most important ones are glutathione, coenzyme Q10, and alpha-lipoic acid. That's because they make all the other ones recycle and come at you again. So those are three things that are very popular in the anti-aging supplements. Now we're going on to oh, omega-3, which is in fish. Most importantly, tuna and salmon. And then you think, well, I thought oil on the skin was bad. Trans fats coming out of your skin as your body wants to eliminate them is not pretty. But when you eat salmon and lots of fish or take fish oil or even get omega-3 out of walnuts or avocados, that coming onto your skin helps with that lipid barrier. Remember earlier I showed a slide where you have water and lipids in your skin? These are the lipids that you want sitting in that layer. Your skin needs those things. So. So fish oil and walnuts and avocados are good fats. They're very beneficial to the body for many reasons. They're beneficial for high blood pressure. They're beneficial for your cholesterol. They are beneficial for people who have constipation. They help when you have joint pain. They help a lot of different things. Diabetes, they will lower your blood sugar for you. I mean, omega-3 fatty acids go everywhere and do everything. Thing. Now, when they do studies to see how much we get, we most people barely get half of what they need. So most of us take in about 130 milligrams of EPA and DHA, which are the components of omega-3. And in France, they've determined that we need about 600. So we're taking about 520 milligrams less than what we actually need. So everyone, pretty much, unless you are a vegetarian who only eats fish, is not taking in enough uh, fish oil. So, and uh, here's a review. I already talked about a lot of the, oh, depression is something I didn't already mention. How much fish oil and omega-3 you have has a lot to do with your mood. And even cancer therapy. They, you know, people with uh, tumors and inflammation. So, but uh, when I tell people to eat fish, a lot of them, a lot of people don't like fish. Or, Salmon, eating that every day is really expensive. Or tuna, well, eating that every day is boring. Well, you can get omega-3 out of a lot of other things like flax seeds, um, chia seeds, hemp seeds. They make milk out of chia, flax, hemp. So there are a lot of different ways to get their omega-3. Now, when I'm talking to people about getting omega-3 fatty acids, frequently I will tell them, I like for you to have a bottle of fish oil in the house, just so you can take it. 
um, when you go to the store, half of the food labels say omega-3. There's eggs that'll say extra omega-3. There's mayonnaise. It will say omega-3. Go over to the butter section. Something will say omega-3. Go to the salad dressing section. They will say omega-3. Look at your orange juice. There will be one with omega-3. Look at the milk. There will be one with omega-3. So it's everywhere. You want to pick as many things up that have omega-3 in them. So you're not just trying to you know, put down pills and have a chore or eat salmon. You want everything you have to have omega-3 in it because it helps with so many different things. So including the flaxseed oil, which is a plant-based for people who are vegetarian or don't like fishy burp or don't like a lot of fish or have a fish allergy. Um, Here's a, I just put the sea cucumber slide in here it's be, um, as an alternative to fish. I, we don't eat this in this country. They mostly eat this in Asia. It's a very popular delicacy in Asia. It's called sea cucumber. They're actually studying extracts from it to grow artificial corneas. To um, They use it as an arthritis treatment in other countries. So. I put this in here just to talk about other, t expand your seafood game. There's more than just fish and tuna. There's other delicacies that people can eat like sea cucumbers. There's oysters. There's clams. They have oyster supplements. Sea cucumber in and of itself, or you've heard of people taking glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate for their joints. Other animals besides just the regular fish and shellfish that we're accustomed to eating have other things for our joints which will also help us with our skin because they all like the same things right. so briefly we're going to talk about ultraviolet light now we've already talked about how skin is impacted by sunlight um, you go out in the sun, the sun gives you a certain ultraviolet ray, it is damaging. There are also lights, and you've probably seen commercials for them, that do the opposite of that. There are, oh, there's a ray of light that damages collagen, there's a wavelength of light that heals collagen, that causes it to grow normally again. So there is basically the opposite of a sun. Um, they, sell, they have them in spas. You can order one on the internet, but it's a, there's different wavelengths of light that will help your skin. There's one wavelength of light that will help with acne. There's a wavelength of light they use for skin cancer. There's a wavelength of light that they use for wrinkles. But just uh, if you are someone who cannot avoid spending a lot of time in the sun, or you already have some wrinkle or skin damage, you might want to uh, look a little, do a little more research about the healing lights. They're very good. I actually use them in my office for people who've had surgery to help their uh, wounds heal, and they, you know, that's what they use in other countries and plastic surgery offices. There a lot. Going the wrong way. Lifestyle. We already talked about rest and attitude. Um, we already talked about the wrinkle creams. One thing I did not mention before is using Retin A. If you ever look at any of the uh, anti aging creams that are over the counter, you will notice that a lot of them say retinol or retinoids or retin something. And almost everything, everything that says wrinkles or scars or anything will have Retin-A. Um, retinol is basically a high-dose form of vitamin A. Uh, it encourages collagen to reproduce in the proper way. Remember I already said that when you're 10, your collagen looks like one thing, and when you're 20 and 30, every single decade that you have of your life, your collagen kind of becomes less efficient with the retinol makes it a little more efficient. 
they use a lot in acne, but um, also a lot of people take advantage of its properties to use for wrinkle prevention. All right. Now, I'm a gynecologist, so there's no way we're getting through an entire talk without speaking about the role of estrogen. And I'm going to use the vagina just as an illustration. We're mostly probably here talking about skin health and your face and arms and everywhere else. But I'm going to have a discussion about vaginal tissue because we've already said that when you're 35 and 40, that's when your collagen starts to change. Well, by the time women are about 50 or 60, they've started to notice that other, in other places their collagen has changed too. And that would be on their vaginal tissue. So just like you can look at your face and everything has changed, if, you, if we all could look in our vagina, and we cannot, but if we could, we would notice that that tissue has changed also. That illustrates the important role that estrogen has on your vaginal tissue. And I already spent time talking about eating fruits and vegetables. Fruits have phytoestrogens in them. So even though we don't all want to take prescription estrogen, paying attention to your fruits and vegetables will give you food with some estrogenic activity, which can help your collagen uh, act properly. I'll go to this slide where it shows the, you can see side by side, the vagina with collagen is a much different thickness than the one without collagen. So some people might have heard of women using estrogen in their vagina for vaginal lubrication, just to keep their vagina healthy, to keep it acting like it did when they were in their 20s. Well. They sell phytoestrogen creams for your face. That's why they're putting soy in some of the uh, skin cream supplements, because soy acts like estrogen. They also have something called estriol, which is a very weak estrogen that they use for anti-aging skin purposes. So as women get older, not only is the vitamin A retinol very important for making your collagen behave properly, but things with soy and estriol and estrogenic type of things. So I'm using the vagina as a analogy, but we can also use the same principles on our face and arms and different places where our skin isn't the way we want it to look. So yes, so skin health inside and outside. You want to use botanicals, vitamins, herbs, all natural ingredients to make your body behave properly. You want to pay attention to your stress level, your sleep level, your hydration level, and all of those different things for your skin. Um, your detoxification status, make sure your colon is okay. So. Any, I'm open for questions now if anyone has any particular thing they want to explore more about their skin. Thank you, uh, Dr. Como. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. I learned a lot. Um, a question, if you would, you can start uh, typing your oh, questions. Maybe I have to unmute myself. Into the, uh, you can start typing your questions into oh. the chat section of the um, webinar screen. And yes, also Dr. Como, you can mute your line until we get questions on the side. And I see several are starting to type, so we will wait for the question to be posted as well. And you can also um, raise your hand to be identified and type your question as well. question comes from uh, LB. What amount of sunscreen is needed for African Americans? Uh, SPF. Oh. Well, I generally think that anything between most 
Uh, normal skin care products have about an SPF of 15 in them. That's usually adequate if you're not the type of person who burns. So somewhere between and 30. Beyond that, I'm not sure that you're getting a lot of extra benefits. Of course, if you have experience, like you use the SPF of 15 and then you burn, well, clearly you need more. But if you don't have very sensitive skin and you don't burn, then I think that a product with 15 and you're just doing normal daily activity is fine. Or maybe something with 30 if you're out at the beach in a really strong sun or if you're going to visit the equator or something like that. Oh, okay. Now, brittle na nails and thinning hair. I think that I mentioned before that a lot of times brittle nails and thinning hair might be something that's suggesting another disease. So when people have brittle na nails and thinning hair, like let's say you're on, you have high cholesterol and you're on Lipitor or some sort of a statin. That drug depletes a lot of your coenzyme Q10 in your body. So that a person with that particular picture, I would say take coenzyme Q10. They would also have a high cholesterol, so I would say well, fish oil is necessary. So in that particular case, I would say take fish oil and coenzyme Q10, and you might notice that your hair gets better. Now let's say I have another person who's 40 and had their ovaries removed, but they have brittle hair. Uh, brittle nails and thinning hair. I might tell that person to take estrogen. Or I might have a third person with the same symptoms who is lactose intolerant and hates everything that's dairy and they don't take a supplement. That person, I would probably say, you know, calcium and vitamin D might be the problem. So brittle nails and hair isn't usually a sign of one thing. It's usually a sign that there's something else wrong and I pretty much would have to look at the different disease profile that the person has or the vitamin profile or something, you know, I would use something for guidance to try to figure it out. Because I do fix that problem all the time, but I probably never tell a person the same thing twice. Of course it is, because as I said, every seven years your body makes new skin. So you could be 50 and have skin that's not what you want it to be. You would assess your status. Let's say you're 50, you're having hot flashes, and you have just gone through menopause. Well, now I know that if you, t if you do nothing different, if you just take no medicine, don't take any antioxidants, don't do anything, by the time you're 60, your skin's going to look 60. Well, let's say you're 50, you already know all of these things are going on. So I have a 50-year-old, she says, I'm having hot flashes, what should I do? I would say, we're going to find a supplement that makes you not feel like you're having hot flashes. I might try black cohosh. I might have her take a soy supplement. I might have her take a combination menopause hot flash supplement. Um, for sure, I want that person to have a normal vitamin D status. Not just to take vitamin D, but I would actually draw their blood level of vitamin D and make sure they're taking enough to be normal. I had a patient today who was taking 5,000 international units of vitamin D and it wasn't even halfway to normal. But she'd have a gastric bypass, so she didn't absorb vitamin D. So we had to come up with ways for her to get her vitamin D levels normal. So it's not necessarily about the amount of different things you take. You just have to figure out what could I be lacking and then make sure you replace it. Because if I would take a 50-year-old who's managing her different medications, her different diseases, who's on a very complete replacement regimen over a 40-year-old who's not doing anything any day. That 50-year-old is going to stay the same and that 40-year-old is going to age if she's not doing anything. So it's just very important to manage your conditions and eat right and exercise and feel good. And you can most certainly reverse the age of um, reverse your wrinkles. Thank you, Dr. Kamo. The next question is from uh, Ms. Shirley. What causes adult acne? Well, just like when a 
a teenager has acne, especially when they're going through puberty, they're usually having some hormonal imbalances. And also a lot of children are not eating properly or taking a vitamin, so they also have vitamin imbalances and they're not sleeping right, so they have stress. Well, the very same thing happens when we get older. We get older. And it's not so much that we are lacking hormones, because a 15-year-old isn't lacking hormones. They're not in balance. So when you get older, even if you are, your hormones are lower, it's the imbalance. It's the stress. It's the, um, a lot of people get adult acne when they're going through menopause. Uh, like As I said earlier, a lot of times as we age, our vitamin requirements change because we had children and we've been bleeding and different things have depleted us. So a depletion in a vitamin can make your skin prone to acne. You might live in Los Angeles and be bombarded by smog. Then you would have adult acne, or you might have, you know, your hormones in flux. So different things cause acne in different people, and so, or even people with, the, you know, just a stressful job in and of itself can make you have acne. You're not sleeping. You're under a lot of stress, and that will impact your skin. Which is a lot of times when people say they've tried proactive or they've tried some sort of uh, skin vitamin and they still have acne. It, it could be a hormonal thing, or it could even be, I talked about probiotics, and so just your colon might not be functioning right, and you might get adult acne just because you're not eliminating properly. So it could be toxins. Uh -huh. The next question is in reference to bioidentical hormones. Can you provide a little information on that topic, bioidentical yeah, um, bioidentical hormones are basically, I don't even know where to begin without giving you like a three-hour lecture on bioidentical hormones, because when I talk about it, it's usually a three-hour lecture. <laughs> but um, it's different than just static dosing of hormones, like when you're taking Prempro or something. I mean, that would be static hormones. I guess the important thing to think about is when you don't take anything and you feel it, that's the problem. Let's say somebody's 50, she's going through menopause, so she's having hot flashes all day long. Well, then she has them all night long, so that means she's up every hour. Well, I've already addressed the fact that if you could, everything can be perfect, and if you do not sleep, more than two or three hours a night, your skin will look bad. So at that point with that particular person, um, does it matter to me whether they take bioidentical hormones or not? I think bioidentical hormones in Europe, they feel that they are safer than the other chemicals that we use in this country that you can get at the pharmacy. But at the end of the day, for the purposes of skin, if I give someone just something generic that you can get at Walmart and they actually sleep all night, guess what? Her skin's going to get better. So do I prefer bioidentical hormones? I do, and, and why is, going, is, like I said, an, a two or three hour discussion. But the important thing is that if you are very uncomfortable and having a lot of mood swings and not sleeping very well, Fix it by any means necessary. Herbs, hormones, ice packs, <laughs> whatever you need to do. But you definitely want to address that. Okay? Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I, hope that, uh, she, I hope that answers your question or provides you just a little information uh, about that. Um, I think that was Monica that answered that question. What causes low uh, hemoglobin? What causes what causes a hemoglobin? Um, a lot of different things. I'll give you a few thoughts on the hemoglobin. Let's say some. It depends on the age of the person. If you told me that someone was 15 years old, I would the first thing I would think is maybe she's bleeding very heavily throughout her cycle and she's not taking enough iron to have a normal hematocrit or hemoglobin. Um, someone could be pregnant 
and the baby might be taking all of their iron, then that person would have a low hematocrit or hemoglobin. It, there could be someone with, uh, who had gastric bypass who doesn't absorb vitamins very well, and that person would have low hematocrit or hemoglobin. So there's a lot of different reasons. So the minute it's low, it's never diagnosing one disease, I usually have to go play, find the disease. Okay. Okay. The next one is, is progesterone safe? Um, it depends on the form of progesterone. Um, I think when they did this study about uh, with Prempro, which is Premarin and Provera. Pro Provera is a type of progesterone that is man-made. Um, they decided that that had some issues, but the problem really wasn't so much the fact that it is progesterone, but the fact that it's modified progesterone. Just like eating real corn has one impact on your body, and eating modified corn syrup has a different impact. Or just like, um, you know, anytime you, or regular soy versus genetically modified soy, anytime you genetically modify something and your body recognizes it as foreign, you can have a problem with it. So, for instance, yams have progesterone. I don't really think that that's a huge major health issue, but of course, if I take that and just you know, progesterone, we've had it in our body, we're born with it, we have a lot of it when we breastfeed, so, and it's been safe for all those years in our body, but sometimes when you take it out of the body and try to mess with it and then take it in a different form, it might not be the best thing to do, so, you know, sort of. Okay. Well, sleeping, yeah, that's another, like, three-hour lecture. <laughs> and I will try not to give a three-hour lecture about sleep. But um, as I alluded to in the past, if you're dehydrated, you might have trouble sleeping. If you're hormonally incomplete, you might have trouble sleeping. So, I, for instance, I have some people who are very stressed. They have very stressful jobs. When they lay down to go to sleep, their mind is still racing. Those people I would usually um, end up putting on an herb like St. John's Ward or Rhodiola or Melatonin, something relaxing and calming to the brain. I might tell them to do yoga, but just if I think that you can't sleep because you're troubled, I would tr try to use something that directs that. Let's say you're not sleeping because you're having just told you aren't going to work. I would definitely have to address your hot flashes. Maybe you would take soy. Maybe you would take black cohosh. Maybe you would take magnesium. There's like a, a lot of different things I would tell people, but I would do something about that particular issue because I, you know, with sleep you have to find out why the person is not sleeping. Does their husband have sleep apnea on a sleep apnea machine? That's one thing. Or are they stressed? Or are they hot flashing? So depending on why the person is not sleeping, I usually address that issue and then. They, it usually works better than if they just take a, something random for sleep. Okay. Okay. And then the last question um, was about skincare products. Uh, how, how, at what point can you determine if a product is ineffective? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, usually, after you've used a one whole bottle because you know skin doesn't change immediately especially with wrinkles and things like that and anybody who's really trying to find out if a skincare product is effective take a picture of yourself before you start to use the product and then probably after a month of really using something all the time you should be able to take another picture and either someone else should be able to see the difference or you should be able to see the difference if you don't see the difference um, evaluate, like, look at the ingredients in there. Can you pronounce all of them? Maybe there's something in that skincare product that's irritating you. Um, are you getting enough sleep? Are you drinking enough water? Because you can take the best cream on the whole planet, and if you don't drink enough water or get any sleep, 
you're not going to see an effect because it's not ever just about the product. It's also about everything else, as I've said. So, but I would pretty much say a month. If you're taking a vitamin after a month, if you see nothing, then you might want to switch or even a, a, any other skincare regimen. Usually about a month and you'll know. It doesn't take six months and it doesn't take three months. Usually after a month, you should have some amount of improvement. Got to keep on reading it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.